So we're right at the left, uh, end section uh, of this chapter, so we're going to end this chapter this morning. honest with you, this is one of the more uh, difficult texts difficult to execute, so let's ask the Lord for His uh, guidance to us, empower us, embolden us, and so that uh, our minds will be illumined by the Word of the Lord. At the end of the day, we want the Lord to be glorified through yes. His Word. That is the purpose of this uh, sermon. So let us uh, bow down and offer this time to the Lord. Lord, we praise you, O Lord. We give glory to your name, O God. You are high and lifted us. Oh Lord, you are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. Lord, you are the King of Glory, O oh God. Lord, we ask, Lord, show your face to us. Make your light shine upon us, O oh God. Lord, illumine our hearts, illumine our minds, so that we will see you, who you are. Really. Lord, you are, you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. You are the Messiah, our Savior, the Savior of this world, O oh Lord. And Lord, may we submit our hearts. Uh, to, to the call of the gospel. May we repent of our sins, O oh Lord. And at the end of the day, Lord, we want your name to be glorified. Yeah. So, Lord, at this time, Lord, we ask that you speak to us. May the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, illumine our hearts, illumine our minds. As we, uh, as we read through your scriptures, O oh God, we want to see you high and lifted up. So, Lord, we ask, we pray, <coughs> we humbly ask you, O oh Lord, it's through your strength, O oh Lord. So this coming Wednesday we will have a uh, public holiday, so the Anzac Day. Yeah. Normally, it is, of course, it's an Australian holiday, Australian New Zealand holiday. Uh, it, it's really to commemorate what, what the uh, what the soldiers did in World War, World War One and World War Two. So all all the uh, fallen soldiers who who died and who uh, fought for for our for against evil, especially many of them uh, fought wars in Europe. So it is a, it's, it is a uh, yearly thing and we, 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 we normally commemorate that. And one of the mottos normally is, lest we forget, lest we forget. Because we, we, we are, we are the tendency of, uh, our tendency is to be forgetful. Yeah. But we, we don't know what happened in the history. We don't know what happened in the past. So many monuments were, were were built in order for us to actually remember what they, that what they did, the heroic acts that they did uh, for our nation. That's for Australia, but in in Jerusalem as well, in Judea, there are many, many, many uh, holidays, many uh, which is more, much more grander festivities and, and public ceremonies. And one of this is what where we are right now. We are in the middle of a, like a public holiday, a public ceremony, but it's much more grand. It it it's, it's, uh, it spans for like seven days and an extra day. So we, we will find ourselves here in the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jewish Feast of the Tabernacles. So why don't we read out the God's God's word today, John chapter seven, John chapter seven. John chapter 7 this is the word of the Lord mm -hmm. on the last day of the feast the great day Jesus stood up and cried out if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink whoever believes in me as the scripture has said out of his heart out of his heart will flow rivers of living water mm -hmm. now this is said about the spirit whom those who believe in him were to receive for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So this is the reaction among the crowd. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This is really, this really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is this the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people of, over them. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one, no one ever spoke. 
spoke like this man? The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? How have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? Now this man comes into the picture. But this crowd does not know that the law is cursed. Nicodemus, which is, we are familiar with that in John 3. Nicodemus who had come to him before and who was one of them and said to them, Does our Lord judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, oh, This is Argument again. Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Praise the Lord for his message. Well, um, that, that is uh, the, the concluding part, at least for this chapter. We are not yet finished with the whole uh, section in John, on John chapter 7 and John chapter 8. It's, it's a one big section here that, uh, that depicts well, what happened uh, when the Lord appeared in public on the Feast of Tabernacles. So let me just give you to you our message this morning. Our message for, for this morning is this, just very simple one. The Messiah comes to fulfill the symbolism contained on the Feast of Tabernacles. So the Messiah comes to fulfill the symbolism contained in the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, it then generates various response from different groups. So it then generates various response from different groups. Well, my first point for us is this. Number one, the proclamation of Christ. The proclamation of Christ. Verse 37 to 39. And we will uh, spend much of our time, majority of our time in, in these few verses here in verse 37 to 39. And then lastly, uh, the division among the crowd, the division among the crowd in verse 40 to 52. And then we will uh, divide it further. Number one, to the positive hypothesis of the crowd. So, so seemingly, they, they seem to have like a positive in inference on, on who this Christ is. It could be a Christ, it could be the prophet. But on the on verses 47 to 52, there were also negative responses, negative bias against Christ. Oh, he's, he's not the Christ, he's a sinner. We will arrest him. So we will uh, uh, deal with that later on. So now we come now to the climax of this of the section here in John. The events here in this section we can say is the turning point is of the whole narrative towards the end of Jesus' ministry. After this event, the opposition against Christ will climb to a higher level. It will be uh, escalated. It will be escalated not just from annoyance, you know, to, 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 to personal annoyance, but to, to hatred, but from hatred, hatred towards scheming and plotting and, and killing. We can see some hints on that on, on verse 19 of John chapter 7, where Jesus alludes to the fact that some are seeking to kill him. In fact, we will read later on, temple guards were tasked to arrest uh, Jesus the, and, and bring him into judgment before the chief priests and Pharisees. After, after this chapter, chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10, we will see the Jews actively uh, seeking and finding ways to kill our Lord, which will of course eventually happen in the next, uh, the last few chapters. The, the Lord, our Lord, the God of heaven, will be killed. But let us just go back to what's happening here at the moment. What's happening here at the moment. Here in the seventh chapter of John, we find ourselves in the middle of a great uh, feast. Uh, it's celebrated by the Jews. This feast lasts for a week. Uh, seven days. And then after seven days, there's an extra day uh, 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 commanded by the Lord for them to com commemorate. We can see that on verse 37 here. John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day. But of course, you, you know, we are we are foreigners to, to this custom. We are with custom and tradition. Uh, so I think it will be profitable for us to sidetrack for a bit and discuss the importance of the feast. Thank you. Uh, discuss the importance of the Feast of Tabernacles. So in the next five, five or ten minutes, not fifteen minutes, next five minutes, we can paint a picture of the whole context here. So what's happening on the background, why therefore on the, at the end, Christ's proclamation is astounding. So number one, let us see the background of the Feast. So, so here, this is the Feast of Tabernacles. So normally there are only three pilgrimage uh, feasts that, uh, pilgrimage feasts, where the Jews uh, climb up to Jerusalem yearly. So one is the Feast of the uh, Yom Kippur, 
uh, the day of atonement, the day of the Pentecost, and, and the, the here the feast of the tabernacle. So the time of the year, what? So we can situate ourselves here. So it normally happens on on September September 23, 2018. Here, so then, this year it will happen on September 23, 2018 to September 30. So seven days. So it's uh, normally uh, it is uh, the the whole season there is it's fall so it's the end of the harvest so that's that's the context of the that that feast so what's the description what's the mood so jo joseph jo jo josephus the early uh, jewish historian um, described it this way it was the holiest and the greatest day of the of the jews greatest feast ever it lasted with seven it lasted seven days with so much rejoicing uh, one writer said it this way, it was immensely popular, that is also known simply as, as the feast. Are you going to the feast? Yeah, oh, what feast are you referring to? I'm going to the greatest feast, the feast of the tabernacles. So pious leaders of the community uh, sang and danced and performed juggling acts to the accompaniment of beautiful music. So it, it, it is written, he who has not seen the rejoicing at the place of the water drawing has never seen the rejoicing in his whole, in his whole life. So it is a joyful mood. We can actually like probably compare it to, to how we celebrate our Christmas or how we celebrate our New Year. Uh, the main biblical text can be found in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 33 onwards, and Numbers 29 and Deuteronomy 16. We will call some of them later on. And then other names, oh, how are they referred to? They are, they are re referred to as, number one, the Feast of the Booths. So it's the same. So when you read through, through, through your Bible, when you read uh, the word Feast of the Booths, it's the same with the Feast of Tabernacles. It's also called the Feast of the Ingathering. We will discuss it later on. Why would they call that? It's also called the Seasons of Our Joy. It's also called the Feast of the Nations. It is also called the Feast of Dedication and Festival of Life. We will discuss a bit more of that later. But the summary here is this. The summary of the whole uh, Jewish feast. Feast Number one, it's historical. It's historical. Historical. So it, it, it pictures uh, the exodus of the uh, Israelite out of Egypt. So in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 33 to 44, and sorry, verse 41 says in here, you shall celebrate it as a feast of the Lord for seven days in the year. It is statute forever throughout your de generation. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths and tabernacles uh, for, uh, for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generation know that I made the people out of Egypt. So it's a remembrance. Remember, let me forget. The last we forget. Oh, build some booths, build some tabernacles. Because what? Remember when back in the back in your past, when you were taken out of Egypt, you were uh, exodus out of Egypt. Where, 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 where were you living? Were you living in uh, in in um, the house of bricks? No, you were living in tabernacles. But I provided for you. The Lord provided for you. And you were able to I, the Lord was able to bring you out of Egypt, bring you out of slavery. So here's some, some picture of, of some, some booths and tabernacles. Just not, not, nothing glorious. It, just the symbol. But the symbolism is what we were looking for. The deliverance of our Lord from the days past. Uh, one writer said it this way. The Torah identif identifies the booth with the temporary dwellings in which the Israelites live in the wilderness during that time. But also it also... Um, uh, it is also representative of the tabernacling of God's presence. That's why it's called the Feast of Tabernacles. It happened when King Solomon dedicated the temple uh, of uh, the greatest temple of, uh, of uh, Jewish uh, history. In, in Jewish history, it, it, the, it was finally established on the day of Solomon and it was dedicated on the Feast of Tabernacles way as well. So that's why you can actually say it like Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Booths. So it's same the same. It's, it's the same thing. And then it also in yeah, after the Babylon cap captivity as well. So in Ezra chapter 3 verses 1 to 4. So it's historical. Historical. So it's the, the point of the feast is really like to go back to the beauty. Go back to the past. Remember the gracious provision of the Lord throughout your history. Also, it is ritualistic. It was ritualistic. 
The Lord himself has commanded them to observe this feast. You shall keep the feast of the verse, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 13, chapter 16 verse 13 to 16. You shall keep the feast of the boots seven days when you have gathered in the produce of your threshing floor and your wine press. You shall rejoice in your feast and your son and your daughter. For seven days you shall keep the feast of the Lord uh, to the Lord your God at the place of the Lord will choose. So here, they were, it is very ritualistic. They, they were commanded to build a hut, uh, like a uh, boots or tabernacles. They were commanded to offer sacrifices. They were commanded to remember the meaning behind the symbols. Uh, normally, uh, what's happening there is they got, uh, in, in, in their uh, hands, they got branches from willows and, and all, all the shrubs, particular shrubs that were present in, in the uh, wilderness. And then another citrus plant, uh, 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 branch on their hand and, and as they march from the pool of Siloam, which is I will uh, discuss later on, as they march from the pool of Siloam, they will wave their branches and remembering, it's waving and remembering that hey, these are the, the, the uh, these are the shrubs and these are the environments that we were we we, we came from. So there's a procession that's come going in, and it was intended to present the, the desert life that had, they enjoyed as they passed through the wilderness. And then, the, the, and then also there is this pool of Siloam. It's a pool of Siloam here. So what's happening is uh, they will gather together in pool of Siloam down here in the lowest city, and it's, it's Jerusalem. So it's going up. So it's going up, 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 up in the temple here. So what's happening is they... Uh, it, they will march from the pool of Siloam and the, the high priest will have a golden pitcher and then as they march through, well, people are uh, shouting, Hallelujah to the Lord, praise be to the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, uh, make your name, make your name famous, O Lord, let your salvation shine on us, O Lord. And people were, uh, were gathering and marching all the way up to the temple and then out on the temple, the high priest will pour out the water and saying, I remember when we were in the, ta in the ta when we were in Exodus, when, when Moses struck out the rock uh, in the desert and water gushed out. Remember that time? Remember that time? This is what is happening now. The Lord has provided for you. Now we can actually have water for for our offering. We can actually freely flow, uh, freely pour out water from our offer from, from from the altar. The Lord has provided for us. The Lord has been good to us. So that's that's the whole uh, picture. Point here is this: God commanded these rituals to intensify yearly the glorious deed that the Lord has done for them. The Lord has promised for His people. And lastly, this is also a messianic. Messianic. The feast anticipate the feast anticipate the coming of His Messiah when they fight when finally joy will break uh, like rivers of flo water flowing. Uh, D.A. Carson said it this way: pouring of the feast of tabernacles refers symbolically to the messianic age in which stream from the sacred rock will flow over the whole earth. In such a way that the, uh, the water from the rock pour forth from the nations of Israel. There will come a time when water will be offered. And this water will pour out to the whole nations. Not just in Israel, but to the whole wide world. And this is what Zechariah has been pointing out. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16 to 18. Then everyone, everyone who survives of all the nations have come against Jerusalem. We shall go up year after year to celebrate the, key, the Feast of the Booths. It was also a promise uh, that, that the, it was also promised that during this time the Spirit of the Lord will be poured out as well, which is what what John is referring to in his comments. Uh, water as one of the symbols of the Spirit of God. The Jerusalem Talmud, uh, Leon Morris, the Australian commentator, said it this way: the, the Jerusalem Talmud connects the ceremonies of and this scripture. The John chapter 7 with the Holy Spirit. And you know, what, you, know, you know what? This is something that is foreign to them. And we will discuss that later on. The Holy Spirit, who's the, oh, the Holy Spirit only did in 12 temporarily and, and, and uh, live in a limited way to, to, to chosen people in Israel. But there will come a time where every one of us will be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That's the wonder of this text, and we will discuss that later on. I promise so much to discuss later on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so her the point here is this. All the events commemorated and celebrated in this festival points toward the coming of Messiah, who is the fulfillment and essence of, and the culmination. He's the fulfillment, he's the essence, and he's the culmination of the Feast of Tabernacles. So that's the whole uh, picture. So why are they celebrating it? Why are they uh, uh, crying out and singing hallelujah, singing Hosanna? Well, they, because why? They were expecting the Messiah. Now the Messiah here comes. Now the Messiah stood up. Now the Messiah cried out, Come to me. I am the fulfillment. I am the, I am the living ones. Come to me. So it makes glory. It's an astounding claim by our Lord on the middle, on, on right at the right timing uh, of the feast. So now let's go to our first point today. Point one, the proclamation of the Christ. The proclamation of the Christ, verse 37 to 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, whoever believes in me. As the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. It's a side comment, it's not a citation, but an allusion. He's alluding to uh, several texts here. Now this is said about the Spirit, whom those who believe in him who were in him were to receive for us yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified so we will spend majority of our time on this first section note number one we can see the impeccable timing of our Lord we can see the impeccable timing of our Lord verse 37 and the first phrase on the last day of the great feast the great day so this is where the setting is Remember, in, in, we discussed that last time, uh, verse 30, verse 14, chapter 7, verse 14, when uh, previous sermon, it, was, it happened on the middle of the feast, on the third day of, of the feast. So now we are on the last day of the feast, so not here on the last day. Again, there are various debates on which exactly is the last day. Could it, could it be the seventh day? Or could it be the eighth day? So we, we, we don't know much, but so, so, I cannot tell for now, but I'm leaning really towards the eighth day of the feast. After the whole celebration, after everything was finished, after the whole ritual was, was, uh, was all done, and here at this point in time, the Lord cried out. It doesn't matter really if it's seventh day at least on how I view it for now. It doesn't matter if it's seventh day or eighth day. The important thing is the fact that Jesus at this appointed time, at this appointed time and appointed season, is now proclaiming to them that in fact he was leaving waters with him. All those rituals, all those events point to him now. Verse 37 b Jesus stood up and cried out. You know what? This is, of course, an unusual posture for a teacher. A teacher normally, uh, a rabbi normally sits sits down and from a, he's sitting from with authority. That's how he normally teach. But here we find our Lord uh, crying out and standing up. Here, Jesus among, it was, is among the crowds, uh, is standing up and crying out to the multitude, which of course, you know, when you do that, it's small, it's small place, we don't have a map anymore, but it's a small place, small temple, many are there. When you cry out, you can, it can actually be heard by anyone. It is in, it is in total contrast to the accusation of, of his brothers and sisters in earlier, uh, or earlier verses on this chapter. Verses 7, uh, chapter Chapter 7, verses 3 to 4. Live here and go to Judea, that your disciples may also know and may see the works that you are doing. Their accusation? No one works in secret. He, he wants to be known openly. Now, now here, the Christ is not a hiding. You will never, never hide. But here, he is proclaiming himself to the whole world, to the whole world, meaning the the people in there now finally Christ is showing himself, revealing himself to the to everyone, making himself known. Not only to small groups of people, during not only to the disciples or to various individuals. Remember Nicodemus, remember the women in the in the well, 
the woman in the well? No, but here the point is he is revealing himself to the whole uh, people in Jerusalem. On a greater crowd, he made himself known to them. That is why he's crying out. That's why he's standing among them and, and inviting them. And what is the invitation note number two? His invitation is this, verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Let him come to me and drink. Again, his invitation is quite appropriate. Quite appropriate. It's been complete uh, a congruence or in, it's, it's a complete cohesion to what is happening in the background. We were talking about waters. We were talking about the pool of Siloam. We were talking about the wrath, uh, the water from the wrath that gushed forth. But here, Christ was saying, oh, all, all of those are gone now. Come to me. I have the living waters. Jason, Jason Rod said this way, and it is thought that our Lord purposely refers to this ceremony of which many, of which the minds of many crowd doubtless be full. Does anyone want true water of life better than any water of Siloam? Why would they want you? Why would want you than the, the pool of Siloam? But the Lord says, let him come to me and by faith draw out of me a living water. It is reminiscent of the acts of our Lord in John chapter 4 in the wells of Jacob with the Samaritan woman offering her living water. But now, now the one of Jesus is offering it now to everyone. It's also reminiscent of the history of Israel when they were freed from slavery and they cried out to the Lord and delivered them out of Egypt. But along the journey in the desert, the Lord provided for them and sustained them for 40 years and giving them manna and Moses struck to the rock. Water flows out. It quenched their tears, thirst. The point of the Lord is this. Yahweh during that time snow. The point here is for them to know that Yahweh saves them. For them to know that Yahweh saves them. It's the one who sustains them. Christ in this event uh, is pointing towards the imagery and proclaiming, I am the true God. I am the true God. I am the living water. I am the one Messiah that you have been waiting for. Come to me. Come to me. There's some note here. Number one, it's a simple invitation. We can notice this one. We can actually observe this. It's a simple invitation for every one of us. Uh, come to me and drink. The Lord has always been, you know, inviting us to come to Him. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1. Come, all of you who are thirsty, come to the Lord. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Your friends outside of Christ, if you're outside of Christ, can, I, can, uh, can you hear the invitation now? As he's being proclaimed to you right now. He has simple invitation for us. Come to him. Drink the living waters that he is offering to us. Maybe it's just maybe it's just you who complicates the invitation of Christ. Maybe you are thinking about your sin and can the Lord pardon my sin. Uh, maybe you are thinking about all the ne all, all about the negative images of Christianity. <clears throat> Or the theological arguments about the deity of Christ or the reliability of scriptures. But there are simple matters that you must understand first. I remember when we were studying, um, normally I teach my younger brothers and sisters uh, uh, for, for their school. So one of their most hated subject is algebra. So you, of course you've got letters and numbers all in one equation. But the simple rule really is this. Simplify. Reduce in lowest terms. Or, uh, and then, uh, uh, reduce in lowest terms and everything will be, it will be much more simpler. Well, for us, some. <laughs> yeah. Christianity reduced to the lowest term or simplified term is this. God is holy. God is just. You, my dear friend, is a sinner. You, my dear friend, is against our Lord. But by His grace, God sent forth His Son to die on your behalf. And He invites us to believe on Him. He invites us to come to Him, to believe on the salva salvation of Christ on the cross. God is holy. You are not. God is gracious. 
God saves through Jesus Christ. Those are simple message that I think you can understand. It is, true, it is a truth that can easily be understood by young boys and young girls. Why don't you fly towards Christ? Simple invitation. Come to the Lord. But note number two, some sub note number two. It's a simple invitation for all. Simple invitation for all. Verse 37 D. Uh, verse 37. We're really progressing here. Verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. The Lord has been gracious to invite us in his presence. It is it is open to, to anyone. Come to the Lord if anyone thirsts. Come to Him. Are you thirsty? Are you part of that every, uh, anyone? To, are you part of that whoever believes in me? Then you are invited by the Lord. That, yeah, then this gospel is for you. Then this invitation is, is for you. Grab the invitation. Come to Christ. You know, for example, to, uh, this year there will be a... Uh, I'm not sure it's actually good illustration but there will be a royal wedding coming up but the whole the whole uh the whole commotion really is will prince harry invite a uh, uh, pre former president barack obama because of all the political tension that's been happening but they decided not to invite them anymore for just just to uh, free them up from, from all these controversies but the point here is uh, invitation is something that is not given to something that is graciously given by the, the one who invites you. And the Lord is inviting you today. The Lord is, is being gracious to you today. Come to the Lord. It is open to everyone who believes. It's open to anyone who is here to let him hear the gospel of our Lord. Let us hear. Marvel at the graciousness of our God. The gospel is being offered to us. And Michael, you've been repeating yourself, but it's being offered to you today. And if I, if I Gonna preach today again. This will always be my invitation. Come to the Lord. Come to the Lord. He is your Savior. He is your Lord. Yes. Come to the living waters. Come to the Lord. And that invitation to you is right here. Right now. Here is eternal life. Here is Christ, the living water. Here is a matter that satisfies our soul. And here is the water that quenched the thirst of our soul. Come. To him. Will you respond, my dear friend? The Lord is gracious. Mm. He asks you to repent of your sin, believe on the gospel, trust in Christ alone. Talk number three. The transformed life of the saints. The transformed life of the saints. Verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Here we can see the effect of transformed life of the saints. It says here that when we believe in Christ, once we believe in Christ, we become uh, we became born again when we put our trust and faith in Him. Then our and uh, from our heart brings forth, uh, flows out, comes forth rivers of living water. We will discuss the. Uh, uh, the that uh, again, this is not a promise. They discuss the that interpretation later on. But again, I want to point out to you now. First and foremost, was the previous condition of our heart. Mm. Uh, before, before, when you were not in Christ, your heart is is a stone, is dead, nothing flowing out of it. Mm. Yes, your yes, you have physical heart. Yes, you have. You probably have. Of course, you have blood flowing out uh, in it. Mm. But your spiritual heart is river of sinful desires it's dead but now you were transformed now that you were re regenerated when your heart is being poured out uh, meta metaphorically to this world similar when the waters from the well, from the golden pictures of the, this, that flows out of the altar what comes out what leaks out is no longer you and no longer your sins but you become a blessing to other people. You are out of you flow the, the effect of the Spirit working in you. Out of you comes forth the effects of regenerated life. Amen. Out of you, uh, out of you comes forth not sinful desires, but holy aspirations to our Lord. Although uh, this ESV study Bible said it this way, although there is no specific scripture uh, referring to uh, out of his heart will flow rivers of water. Again, this is not an allusion. I'm sorry, this is not a citation, but an allusion from our Lord. Uh, although there is no specific scripture 
the, that matches this word here, he is apparently giving a summary of the teaching and implication of several passages. One of them is this, Isaiah 58, 11, And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire. And you in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And also in Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3, uh, with joy, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flows the springs of life. So this is a, that is a transformed life of the believer. Note number four, the interpretation. The, the interpretation, the spirit. The spirit will regenerate you and empower you. The spirit will regenerate you and empower you. We can see that on um, verse 30, 39. Now this is said about the spirit. Whom those who believe in him were to receive. For us yet the spirit had not been given. Because Jesus was not yet uh, glorified. John here, John here was interpreting Christ's word for us. And we normally see that in, in John, you know, like he, he, he's talking something, it's like, ah, I got some side comments, you know. So he, he, that's the no, normal uh, literary style of John. And what, this is one example of that. Note, sub note number one. The works of the Spirit is partially, we must understand, the works of the Spirit uh, is partially shown in the Old Testament. It is partially shown in the Old Testament. We can see that in, cre in creation, the Spirit hovers through the waters. So it is part of the, of the whole creation uh, activity. He is there to, perf uh, to empower particular tasks to particular people. The Spirit enables some people to do a uh, particular task in connection, in connection, in connection to building the temple, in connection to the whole uh, Israel nation. Not just for individual purposes, but to, for the whole nation of Israel. If Samson is an example. And some of them are, were the workmen who built the, the first the tabernacle and then the temple of the Lord. You can see actually see that the Spirit of the Lord was, was with this man. He spoke also through the prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. This is what is interesting. The Spirit's manifestation during the Old Testament is this. We can classify this, describe this this way. It is limited in distribution. Limited in distribution. Or oh, it's given to the prophets and to these particular people. And what? Temporary in dispensation. I will just give the Spirit for you right now. But the Spirit of the Lord is not always with you. It's not always just with you. It can trap. It can. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord can be in any people. So it's 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 limited in distribution. Temporary in dispensation. Dispensation. So note number two. The Spirit's work is always in relation to Christ. We can see that in verse thirty-nine. For us yet. The Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet uh, glorified. The whole chaos between the, uh, the the whole chaos between the charismatic world right now roots to the fact that they tend to isolate the work of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, as if this is a different office uh, to Christ, as if as this Christ is disconnected to the to this whole event that is happening here. But John chapter 16, we will discuss this later on uh, in probably the next few months. John chapter 16, verse 13 to 14, a uh, 16th chapter of John. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will speak not on His own authority. He, whatever He hears, He will speak and He will declare to you the things that are to come. Uh, verse 14, He will glorify me, yeah. Jesus Christ. He will glorify Jesus Christ for what He will take what is mine and declare it to you. This, uh, this is how I can say, uh, just for us to summarize the work of the Spirit here in this table. The Spirit illumines the Bible for us, uh, unders uh, underscoring the centrality of Christ 
It's when, it's when we read the scripture that he is the Holy Spirit enlightens our minds so that in the end as we read through Matthew, as we read through Ezekiel, as we read through, through the sufferings of Job and the, the restoration of Nehemiah, as we read through the whole history of Chronicles and to the Kings, as we read through the history of Exodus and down, down to, to uh, Daniel and to, so, to Joseph, to, to Jacob, to to, to everyone down until Adam, the Spirit will say to you, Hey, this is about Christ. But also, the Spirit empowers gospel preaching. The Spirit empowers gospel preaching. Why? To, for us to proclaim the gospel of Christ. As Acts 1 chapter 8. The Spirit brings forth regeneration. New life in Christ. The Spirit now sanctifies us. This is Christ given to you. This is Christ illumined to you. This is Christ given to you. Now conform yourselves to Christ. But how can I do that? I cannot do that. No, the Spirit is here for you to help you, to sanctify you so that you will be made in the image and likeness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What breaks my heart is this. And I've seen this many, many times. Oh, you yeah, other ladies, other ladies quite small. It, very few few people in population, probably a few hundred thousand just, just here in CBD. But I've seen many times, uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, uh, 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 hundreds and hundreds of thousands due to the work of the Holy Spirit. And the, uh, sorry, it's hard to explain this, but... For the sake of the power of the Holy Spirit, they will ask miracles and healings without in connection with the actual work of Christ. Without them realizing that the greatest miracle is this, look at your soul. Once you were dead in your sins, once you were dead in your sins, but now you are alive in Christ. Oh, church, when we discuss the Spirit, let us discuss Christ, our Lord. Let us glorify our Lord. Let us glorify our Lord. The wonder of the Spirit, the Spirit here, as He is finally revealed, He is the glorific, glorification of Christ. The glorified glorification of Christ points to these following events. Christ, crucifixion, Christ's resurrection and Christ's ascension. Now on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, uh, the Spirit descend mightily among the first fruits. They are, they are the first fruits. And what is Pentecost? Pentecost is Pentecost is, is the first fruit. It is a promise that, hey, many more will come. You are the first fruit. But hey, generations from now, many, many, many more will come to our Lord. God, now Christ is here. Now Christ is being offered to the whole world. Uh, finally, it doesn't mean the Spirit had not yet been given. doesn't mean that the work of the Spirit prior to Jesus Christ's resurrection uh, was not there. The verse therefore means that the Spirit had not been given in the full and powerful sense that was promised in the new covenant age, in the messianic age, right now. And I'm going to execute this text for, to you in a, in a different way. I'm going to ex execute this text and asking you questions. Number one, when was the last time you praised the Spirit of the Lord because He performed to you the greatest a miracle of life? You were once dead in your sins, but now I like God. Praise be to the Lord of God. Praise be to, to the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord who converted us, who, who showed us the way to our Lord Jesus Christ. Once we were blind in our sins, but now we see our Christ crucified, our Christ as our Savior. We cannot do it on our own. The Spirit has to illumine our hearts. When was the last time you praised the Lord because He dwelt in you forever? The spirits, the prophets were dwelt by the Spirit temporarily. And they hold the office. They are not the ordinary people of God. But you, you are ordinary people of God. You are ordinary people of God. Not one of us here occupies some certain position of power. But the Spirit of the Lord is in you. It's in you. Something new that has not been fully exposed in the Old Testament. Now, Christ, the Spirit, is in you. He continued to mold us. Oh, this is new and it's 
astounding to the New Testament because it brought in us forever. Oh, let us praise the Lord for He continued to mold us so we will be in continuous conformity to our Lord. When was the last time you praised the Spirit of God because of the gospel preached to us? To us. This is English text. This is not Arabic. This is not Hebrew. This is the gospel of Christ which is being preached to us in a language that we can understand. In this Bible, He limit the text for us. We don't have to study the, the ancient text. The gospel is not being preached to the whole nation from every tribe, from every language, from every nation. Oh, let us praise the Lord because we are the fruits of, of the harvest initially started on the day of Pentecost. Now we are the fruits and we expect more fruits from the Lord because we know His gospel will be proclaimed. His spirit will work among everyone. Oh, those of those who, of those of whom He called. When was the last time you praised God? Because now you are real prophets of God. When was the last, what was the task of the prophet to bring forth the gospel to every nation? To bring forth and to declare to people and say to people, say to the people, everyone, hey, that says the Lord, that says the Lord, Matthew chapter 11, that says the Lord, Acts chapter 2, that says the Lord, Revelation chapter 21, that says the Lord, I am the prophet of God, and the Spirit empowers us, emboldens us to actually declare to everyone, hey, 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 listen, I have the word of the Lord, yes, I'm an ordinary man, but the Spirit of God empowers me, hey, listen, this is the word of the Lord. Oh, let us praise the Spirit. Let us praise the Spirit to empower us to go to the world, to go to every part and ministry that the Lord has given to us. Every time we go to Dubai, every time we go to, uh, to streets in, in North Adelaide, the Lord is empowering us. The Spirit is empowering us. Look at us. We don't have much influence here, but the Spirit emboldens us. We don't have much political power and power. No, but the Spirit of the Lord is with us. One of the greatest impression of my life uh, when I was a young preacher is always on a Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday morning, to come up to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't do this. Looking at myself, Lord, me. I don't want to be the people. I'm an introvert man. You are socially awkward man. How can you use? How can, how can I do this? Lord, but praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord. We empower us. We praise be to the, to the Spirit who said to us, proclaim the goodness and graciousness of our Lord in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church, that was a revelation of Christ. Uh, uh, that was a revelation of Christ to them as we will send uh, very quickly in the next, next, next few verses. That, that, that was uh, when the Lord cries out, Come to me. This is the Spirit of living waters. He was speaking about the Spirit of God be, being poured out for us. However, point number two was very quick. The vision among the crowds, verse 40 to 52. What, what are the reactions from the crowd? Some say, this is a positive hypothesis from the people. Some say, oh, it, it was a prophet, prophet, promise. Verse 40, when they heard this word, some of the people said, this is really is a prophet. Some say he was a Christ. Verse 41, this is the Christ. Some have doubts. As not the scripture said, verse 41 to 42, that the Christ comes from the offspring of David, comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Some were undecided. So there was division among people, verse 43, over them. Some felt powerless over Christ. Verse 44, some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid, laid hands on him. Some were amazed by him. The officers came, verse 45, came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring, to him, bring him? The officers answered, No one spoke ever like this man. 
However, negative biases from the Pharisees. Here, as if the Pharisees supposed to view all the legal and moral procedures during the, the, that time, have themselves breached what was commanded by God. They breached their own law. It is as if they already had a judgment against Christ. It was later on pointed out by Nicodemus, verse 47. Uh, the Pharisees answered, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities in Paris believed in him? But this crowd does not know that the law is a curse. Nicodemus, who had gone before him, verse 50, was one of them said, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Break from Galilee too. Search, no prophet comes arise from Galilee, which of course they don't, don't know their scripture. Jonah comes from Galilee. Mm. Oh, dear friend, this morning we all have different reactions. Mm. But my prayer to you, that your reaction is not those mentioned above, mm. but real and genuine faith mm. to Christ. Mm. Christ. As we conclude this service, Christ uh, fulfilled the symbolism containing the Feast of Tabernacles, particularly to the pouring out of the Spirit, when they symbolize the promise coming in the Spirit of God that will be poured out to every believer. To regenerate them, to conform to them, to conform them to the image of Christ and empower and open them to preach the gospel. Oh, church, let us praise the Spirit of the Lord. Let us praise our God. Let us glorify our Lord. He has saved us. He has been gracious to us. Let us praise the Lord. For we 